Good morning. Hi, welcome to Grand Rounds in person. How nice. And for those of you online, thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Laura Zukowski, the Vice Chair for Education, and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jeremy Smith today. Dr. Smith is Associate Professor, Director of Educator Development, and Associate Program Director for the Internal Medicine Residency. Dr. Smith graduated from Northwestern University and did his residency there as well. And then he was chief resident for a year at Cook County Hospital. And before joining our department, he was a member of the faculty in Malawi, Africa, at Northwestern and at University of Illinois at Peoria where he, while he was in the National Health Services Corps. If you had the pleasure of seeing Jeremy teach a small group give a lecture, or if you've been a learner on GMED 1, you won't be surprised to know that he received a large number of teaching awards over the last 15 years that he's been a member of our faculty. These awards have come from both colleagues and house staff and include Star Educator Honor Roll, the Golden Bucky Award, Graham Meyer Teaching Award twice, Faculty Excellence in Clinical Teaching, and from the Medicine House Staff, Excellence in Teaching, Ambulatory Teaching Award, and Bedside Teaching Award. Jeremy has given numerous presentations locally, regionally, and nationally, and he embodies the philosophy that we should have fun while learning. And that's easy to tell from the title of a few of his recent talks. One, Leadership Communication, or How to Avoid Shifting Dullness and Adynamic Ilias When You Talk. And wow, that lecture stunk. How to avoid being Ferris Bueller's teacher. For any of you who've seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm really looking forward to having fun while learning today from Dr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for that. I, uh, that was a lot of accolades. Um, I mean, just to keep it complete, I think you, you missed the part about when I was in World War I and Gallipoli and I was in the trenches and I you know, jumped on the grenade and saved the battalion. It's not important. It's not really relevant to what we're talking about today. So, uh oh. This was working. I wanna see a show of hands for those who are tired of COVID. Okay. That is the last time I'm gonna say that word over the next hour. Instead, we are going to talk about the eight most impactful studies while we were dealing with it that have nothing to do with it. I'm a general internist. I'm a proud general internist. I am not a specialist. And so for each one of these studies that we're going to talk about, there'll be at least two people in the audience who know a heck of a lot more about that topic than I do. So when we get to the Q&A, please feel free to speak up and correct anything I may, have, I may have gotten wrong. And I want to keep my attention on the specialist just for a moment because this talk is for you. So you know what Thanksgiving, when you're in the middle of that meal, and you're enjoying the camaraderie of the dinner. And then your cousin Phil says to you, hey, what about that study I just read about the Mediterranean diet? So I have to start eating the Mediterranean diet. And you're like, in your head, I don't know. I'm a pulmonologist. I don't read the Mediterranean diet studies. I have no idea. And so what do you do in that moment? I know what you do. You BS it. And so this is my gift to you today. All the studies we're gonna talk about are from the primary care realm. And so I'm gonna equip you so that the next Thanksgiving meal you're at, you can say to yourself when asked the question, wait a minute, I know this. Jeremy talked about this at Grand Rounds. So you're welcome. The criteria of the studies that were chosen for this talk are they had to be published in the last two years. They had to fall under the purview of primary care. And in my mind, they had to change the way that you practice medicine. And so we're going to start with your dad. You are hanging out with your family, but your grumpy old man is 
chatting with you on the phone. He's got a history you know of hypertension, COPD, and osteoarthritis. And here are his medications. Look carefully, because you're gonna get asked about this. He's on teotropium as an inhaler for the COPD. He's on amlodipine 5 and chlorothalidone 25. Your dad doesn't smoke. He just drinks a little bit, not very much. You happen to know that his blood pressures at the last office visit were 135 over 82. And you, when you ask him what they run when he checks them at home, he very grumpily tells you, ah, eh, usually like 130s over 70s. And he says, God, that doc keeps bothering me about my blood pressures. Bah. Okay. Take out your phones or open up your laptops. And if you are listening to this online, this works for you too. Open up your browser. So if you're on an iPhone, you'll go to polyv. You'll go open, open uh, Safari. If you're on an Android, you'll open Google Chrome. And then enter this address, polyev.com slash jpsmith. And when you've done that, you'll be able to vote. People are already voting. So again, this works if you are online as well. Uh, if you missed it, at the very top of the slide, you'll see the website you need to go, the address you need to go to, pollev.com slash jpsmith. And the question is, what do you recommend for your dad? Nothing, no change. Do you increase his chlorothalidone to 50? Do you tell him to stop that teotropium? Do you increase his amlodipine to 10 from five? Yeah, just chill. Maybe a little CBD oil might relax you. 18% of the people at the University of Wisconsin think that's the right choice. Okay, I got some work to do. This is great. Okay, so this is live polling and we have a consensus. We'll see if that's correct. All right, so the first study we're gonna talk about is called the STEP trial. This came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in the last year. And the background on STEP is this. We know, first of all, without any doubt, that there is benefit in treating older patients who have systolic hypertension. But these old studies like Shep and Sistier and Hyvett were all done in older patients who had blood pressures in the 160 range. So we know to bring them from the 160s to the 140s has benefit. We've known that for a long time. The landmark study of the last decade was SPRINT. And you may, if you haven't heard about this, you should read it. The goal in SPRINT was a systolic goal, uh, systolic blood pressure of less than 140 versus a systolic goal of less than 120. These were the four inclusion criteria for SPRINT. You will notice one of them is age over 75. And SPRINT showed a 25% relative risk reduction for major adverse cardiovascular events in the aggressively treated group. Now, they did a subsequent substudy of that age over 75 group which is called SPRINT 75. And that confirmed that even in that group of people over 75, aggressive treatment resulted in a, about a one third reduction in MACE. There was the price to be paid for more aggressive treatment. There was more hypotension in the aggressive group. There was more syncope, AKI and electrolyte abnormalities. So there's been controversy about what the goal should be in older patients. In fact, JNC8, said that if you are over the age of 60, the goal is less than 150 for your systolic. And the AC, ACP AAFP 2017 hypertension guidelines agree with that. But the ACP guidelines that came out for, sorry, ACC guidelines for hypertension are different. And they say if you're over 65, your systolic goal is less than 130, quite a difference, quite a discrepancy. So there's a lack of consensus among even national authorities about what the systolic goal should be in older patients. And that's what this study was designed to figure out. So this was a large randomized trial from China. It was not industry sponsored, uh, 8,500 patients. And the inclusion criteria where you had to be 60 to 80 years old and you had to have hypertension as defined by either taking medication for hypertension or a documented blood, systolic blood pressure over 140. They were excluded, that you were excluded if you'd had a, a large ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. I don't know why. Secondary hypertension patients were excluded and patients with low diastolic blood pressure. And then they were randomized to two groups. Basically, you can think of this as 110s to 120s as the goal versus 130s to 140s as the goal. Does that make sense? And they did not have a very proscriptive algorithm for how to treat these patients. They used almost certain amlodipine and hydrochlorothiazide, 
but it was up to the clinician's discretion about what to use, what dose, and in what order. But the way they did this was if you were over 130 at the follow-up visit in the aggressive group, you got your dose increased. If you were less than 130 in the lenient group, your dose, did I say that right? Your dose was reduced. So your dose was increased in the aggressive group if you were less than 130, and your dose was reduced in the lenient group if you were, I said it wrong again. Okay, you guys get the point, right? It's written right there on the slide. All right, and these medication changes were based not on clinic readings, but rather on office readings. That's important to understand. And the primary outcome was non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, cardiovascular death, revascularization, hospitalization for CHF. They also measured renal outcomes, all-cause mortality, and they did, of course, look at safety outcomes, including hypotension and syncope. So what do they find? First of all, the median age was 66, about half were women. This was done in China, and 100% of the patients were of Han Chinese ethnicity. 19% had diabetes coming in, and 6% had cardiovascular disease. The trial was halted early because of differences in the results, and so the average follow-up turned out to be about three years. Now, this slide is just the blood pressure differentiation. X-axis is time, Y-axis is systolic blood pressure, and you can see that they rapidly and consistently achieved significant separation in the aggressive group versus the lenient group. So they did that successfully, and their average blood pressure in the aggressive group wound up being about 127 versus about 136 in the lenient group. And so now here's the money slide. Again, X-axis time, Y-axis is MACE, and you can see there was a 26% relative risk reduction in the people who were treated aggressively into the 110s, 120s range. So put another way, the event rate over those three years, 3.5% three versus 4.6%, that results in a number needed to treat of 91 over three year period. They looked at subgroups, it didn't matter what your age was, didn't matter what your sex was, diabetes, or if you were coming in a little hypotensive on the diastolic or had a wide pulse pressure, people we might be concerned about, they had the same benefit. There was no difference in all-cause mortality, which is, by the way, different than what Sprint found, for what that's worth. Uh, people were, of course, having to take more medication in the aggressive group, 1.9 versus 1.5 average number of medications in those two groups. And yes, there was more hypotension in the aggressive group, as you might expect. Although there was no difference, unlike Sprint, in acute kidney injury or dizziness, and there was no difference in fracture risk. There was a non-significant trend in more syncope, but the absolute numbers here were six versus two out of 8,500 patients. So very, very low rates of syncope in both groups, but you might suggest maybe a few more in the aggressive group. So what the STEP trial confirmed for us is that in patients at least age 60 to 80, treating your, to a systolic goal of under 130 leads to significant benefit relative to patients who are left in the 130 to 140s range. So the answer to this question for this man who's in his 70s, who's got a systolic blood pressure consistently in the 130s would be to step up his therapy. So the right answer here would have been to increase the amlodipine. I'm glad no one wanted to bump up his chlorothaladone and cause profound hypokalemia. That was the right decision. But D is the answer here. Okay, so you're hanging out and now your sister texts you one Saturday morning. And she has a history of hypertension, and she's had two prior episodes of depression. She's actually been on remission from her depression for the last three years. She takes an SSRI. She's never been hospitalized. There's no suicide attempt. She's on sertraline 100. She's also on chlorothalidone for the blood pressure, and she's on a torvastatin. And she says to you, hey, sis, do I have to keep taking this? I feel fine. Can I get off this sertraline? What do you tell her? What do you tell your sister who wants to stop her antidepressant? Sure, yeah, you can stop it. We have evidence for that. Okay, but you are at high risk of relapse if you stop. You need to stop regardless because of an interaction between the sertraline and the atorvastatin. Or haven't you been watching the news? This is not the time to stop an antidepressant. Okay, it's not much of a battle here. Looks like the consensus is B. We'll see if you're two for two. So this study was called um, Antler, you know, and the psychiatrists are so excited. They have one of these like 
big cardiology trials that we talk about with all the acronyms. They have one of those, and now they have two. This one's called Antler. It made it in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is a very exciting moment if you're a psychiatrist. So the background here is this. We know that the antidepressant prescription rate has increased dramatically. You can see this, the, the data there. The guidelines are a little nebulous. So there are guidelines in the psychiatric literature that say that you should treat for nine months and then consider stopping. Those guidelines are from 1999 when I was in residency and more recent APA guidelines just don't comment on the duration, but that's about the best we have. So that's one of the questions. There have been some reviews that show a high rate of relapse, but those reviews were flawed for numerous reasons. There's really been no good data thus far on long-term responders to antidepressant therapy. And so the Antler trial was a multi-center trial from the United Kingdom and uh, almost 500 patients. And here are the inclusion criteria. You had to be an adult. You had to have at least two prior episodes of depression, like our patient, or you had to be on an antidepressant for at least two years, either one of those. They included you only if you were on one of these four antidepressants. I won't get into the reason why, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but you had to be on one of these four antidepressants and you had to feel recovered and you had to feel, quote, well enough to stop, like your sister does. She feels well enough to stop, she feels fine. You were excluded if you had current depression and of course they made everyone complete a validated scale to assess who was actively depressed. Then they were randomized, stop your meds or continue your meds and they followed them for a year. The primary outcome was relapse of depression. So they had sequential follow-up visits at which time they had to complete a validated scoring system for depression. And that's how they measured if you'd had a relapse or not. They also measured PHQ and GAD7 scores, physical side effects. They measured symptoms they thought would be consistent with drug withdrawal or SSRI withdrawal symptoms. And of course, quality of life. So the median age was 54, three quarters were women. Uh, this is in the UK, 95% were white, so not very diverse. 94% had at least three episodes of prior depression and about three quarters had been on medications for depression for at least three years. And here are the results. X axis is time, Y axis is freedom from relapse. So the higher, the better. And you can see here that the, the hazard ratio of having a relapse of your depression was double if you stopped your antidepressant, even in these well-controlled patients. So put another way, if you wanna quote a pay to a patient, you would say, if you stop your antidepressant, the risk of relapse is 56%. It's pretty high if you don't stop it too, isn't it? 39, but there's a clearly statistically significant difference between those two groups. So the number needed to harm is six, that's pretty small. They measured another way after just 12 weeks of cessation, 44% quote felt worse, as compared to just 21% in the maintenance group. Uh, the similar results were found when you looked at PHQ-9 and GAD-7 scores. Uh, although after 52 weeks, those narrowed, although there was a lot of crossover, which I'll show you in a sec, there was no difference in medication side effect scores. Uh, the discontinuation group did as expected have more withdrawal symptoms, even though it was a very slow taper over two months actually of the SSRI. But 39% of the, people in the study who were assigned to the discontinuation group who were encouraged to stay in that group said, I'm out. I want my antidepressant back. So what we learned is that stopping an antidepressant in patients who've had at least multiple episodes of prior depression does confer a high risk of relapse, which your patient needs to be aware of if they're going to make that decision. So the correct answer here, you guys are two for two, is B. Uh, you can stop it if you like, but just know you are at high risk of relapse if you stop. And that's antler. Okay, your cousin, you're just hanging out trying to relax at your house on a weekend and Keith shows up, your cousin Keith. Your cousin Keith, my wife Shannon trained in the South and she came up here with an expression that she used sometimes, which is this person looks like they were rode hard and put away wet. It's an old Southern expression. Keith's been rode hard and put away wet. He's a 65 year old guy. He's got a history of hypertension. He's got CKD stage four and he's pre-diabetic. So here are his meds. Take a look. He's on Herbisartan 300. I'll just let you know that's the max dose. And he's on Amlodipine 10, also the max dose. He, uh, he tells you that when he was in clinic yesterday, seeing his doctor, he was 149 over 92. And then you say, well, do you check at home? And he says, yeah, I do. 140s to 150s over 90s. He's a non-smoker. He says occasional alcohol. You leave it at that. 
Here is Labs, his BUN and creatinine. He's got a creatinine of 2.73. His EGFR is down to 25. And his potassium, you know, is already sitting at 5.1. And he says, Oi, these meds are bullocks, right? That's what Keith says to you. So what, what do you tell Keith that he should do next to help his uncontrolled hypertension? Do you add spironolactone, 12.5? Do you add carvedilol, 12.5 BID? Do you add chlorthalidone, 12.5? Do you add clonidine? Or do you give him impagliflozotidogliptin? Because doesn't that solve everything these days? That's a name I made up. That medicine doesn't exist. Uh, if you're just joining us, by the way, at the top of the slide, pollev.com slash JP Smith, that is what you can put into your web browser to access the polling for these. And this polling, of course, is anonymous. So, wow, we have a strong consensus that you guys want to add chlorthalidone to this patient with CKD. Let's see if you're right. So in December, this study came out in the New England Journal, chlorthalidone in the setting of advanced kidney disease. So the background is this. We know that somewhere to around 50 to 80% of people with advanced kidney disease have uncontrolled, have less than optimally controlled blood pressure. It's a very high number. We also know from one of the landmark studies of the last 30 years, all hat, that chlorothalidone is a very effective antihypertensive in general. It actually outperformed lisinopril and amlodipine in all hat in some secondary outcomes. We also, if you've heard the old rule about thiazides, the rule is, oh no, you can't use thiazides in advanced CKD. They don't work. You have to switch to a loop. And in fact, there are some references in renal guidelines that allude to the idea that you need to, at a GFR of 30, you need to switch to loops if you want to control hypertension. So the idea of using a thiazide in this setting has been questioned. And the question of this study is, is that voodoo? Or is that really based on, if, if you dig like I did in preparation for this talk, you find that the studies that showed that about thiazides date from the 1950s. So that's what they were trying to sort out. This was a double blind randomized trial from Indiana University. They had 160 patients. The inclusion criteria, you had to have CKD4, which is a GFR of 15 to 29. You had to also have uncontrolled hypertension and you had to already be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or a beta blocker at the time of randomization. If you, if you had very significant hypertension, you, you were excluded. And if you had a history of a stroke or MI, you were excluded as well. And then they took all the medicines before randomization and they standardized them. If you were on an ACE inhibitor, they put everyone on lisinopril. If you were on an ARB, they put everyone on losartan. Calcium channel blocker, they all went on amlodipine. The beta blocker people, they all got put on a tenolol. And if you were on a loop, which some of them were, they were all put on torsamide. So they were standardized. And then they were randomized at that moment to chlorthalidone versus placebo. And the way they did this, I'm not sure if I have this as a bullet, but the way they did this was you started on 12.5 of chlorthalidone. And then four weeks later, they checked your blood pressure. And if you were still over 135, they bumped you up to 25 milligrams. And then four weeks later, if you were still high, they bumped you up to 50 of chlorthalidone. So pretty aggressive. And they only didn't do that if you had symptomatic orthostatic hypotension or a potassium less than 3.0. And then they follow these people up just for three months. They just wanted to see what was the blood pressure impact of this. They weren't looking at hard outcomes. The primary outcome was just a change in your systolic blood pressure at 12 weeks. They also looked at change in urinary albumin ratio, uh, albumin creatinine ratio, BNP, uh, renin-aldo levels, and total body volume. And the median age was 66, uh, three quarters were men, uh, significant uh, racial diversity in this study. And then the mean GFR was down at 23. 60% were on loop diuretics at the time of randomization and they were allowed to continue those. They just had to be on torsamide. Three quarters diabetes, the third had coronary disease, 25% had gout at baseline. And then the mean baseline blood pressure was 141 over 73. And they were all on average taking already three and a half antihypertensive medications. So the mean dose, it turned out, in the active group who got the real chlorothalidone maxed out at 23 milligrams on average. So, so they would stop increasing your dose if you achieved goal. In the placebo group, as you can imagine, they kept increasing the dose of the placebo because it wasn't having the same effect and they got to a higher dosage. So put another way, here's the table. On the uh, x-axis is time and the y-axis is systolic blood pressure. And you can see a significant difference in the systolic blood pressure. It's quite impressive, actually. 11 millimeters of mercury with chlorthalidone in this group. And the diastolic dropped five. 
and there was no effect. Uh, you, you still had a significant drop, even if you were on baseline loop diuretics. And then they saw this very uh, surprising and impressive, significant drop in the albumin uh, to creatinine ratio in the active group, uh, down 50% in the 12 weeks. So as expected, there was a price to pay. So you see the columns there are chlorthaladone versus placebo. I would encourage you to look at the parenthesis there. That's the percentages. And you can see that there was an increase in serum creatinine, much more common in the chlorthaladone group. We'll come to that in a second. But more hypokalemia, more hypomagnesemia, more hyponatremia, more hyperglycemia, more hyperuricemia, and more dizziness. And those of you who've used a lot of chlorthaladone, like I have, are probably not surprised. You see this with chlorthaladone. There was no difference, however, in serious adverse events, including hospitalization as a consequence of the medication. So AKI, what, what really happened? What is the renal impact of this? So when they measured it at 12 weeks, the average GFR had dropped 2.7 milliliters per minute in the chlorthalidone group and not much change in the placebo group. So if you think about this a different way, who had a 25% increase in their creatinine? Almost half the people in the chlorthalidone group did. That could be a little scary if you're taking care of a CKD4 patient. But take a look at this. Look at this carefully. If you were not on loops at baseline and during the study, then the risk of a 25% increase was just 21% versus 13% in active versus placebo. If you were maintained on loops concomitantly, then the risk was 59% versus 13%. So the takeaway here might be a couple of things I would say. Number one, do not try to do this in the setting of a loop diuretic. You probably need to stop your loop if you're going to do this. And secondly, most of this blood pressure drop was actually achieved at the 12.5 milligram dose of chlorothaladone. You got a little bit more bang for the buck if you went to 25 and then to 50, but not a lot, and probably not worth whatever cost you would incur in terms of side effects. So chlorothaladone effectively lowers blood pressure in patients with advanced CKD. We've blown up this idea that thiazides don't work in patients with advanced CKD. So the answer here is C. I mean, you could do spironolactone, but his K is already 5.1. And I forgot why Carvedilol, I didn't like that one. He's high, uh, bradycardic, maybe, I don't remember. Clonidine you could do if you wanted to, but side effects there too. E doesn't exist. Okay. Oh, your grandma's calling you to chat. That's so nice. She feels good. She's in good health. She has a history of hyperlipidemia. She's on pravastatin. That's it. She walks 20 minutes twice a day. She doesn't take any vitamins or supplements. Sonny? What about vitamin D? Do I have to start taking that? What do you tell? Oh, by the way, her T-score, you know, because she tells you this, was showed osteopenia, but not osteoporosis. She's never had a fracture. What do you tell your grandma about vitamin D? Ah, eh, forget it. You should take 800 units a day. You should take 2,000 units a day. The evidence shows 5,000 units a day is best. Or what about the other golden girls? What are they doing? Oh, now we finally have a little horse race going on here. You guys are three for three. So this is, this is really important as to which one. Okay, so it looks like 2,000 is gonna win. One brave person wants to give 5,000 units a day. Okay, that's more than you need. So this is another, I think, landmark study that we're gonna talk about. It's called Vital. It just came out about two months ago. Okay, the, the state of the evidence with vitamin D I think we can summarize in this fashion, right? I mean, okay. I was so happy to be able to present this study because it kind of cleans up this room a little bit. So here's what we know. There's been a large increase in the amount of vitamin D supplementation that's been going on. We do know that observational studies show, or some of them, not all of them actually, show that when you have a low vitamin D level, you also have a higher risk of fracture. Is that correlation or causation? You know, we don't know. There have been numerous studies and meta-analyses. There, uh, there was one study that showed 24 meta-analyses have been done. That's 24 meta-analyses. So you need like a meta-analysis of the meta-analyses at this point for whether vitamin D helps to reduce fracture risk. And there have been mixed results. Some of the, there's been at least one randomized trial that showed reduction in fracture risk with vitamin D supplementation. There have been at least four others that showed no such benefit. And the meta-analyses that I referred to have come to different conclusions on whether vitamin D is beneficial in terms of fracture risk. 
The USPSTF is like, we don't know. They threw out their I recommendation, which means insufficient evidence. Insufficient evidence, you have 24 meta-analyses. What more do you need? But they give it an I for doses more than 400. They, they do not recommend less than 400. That's been shown to be ineffective. The only real guidelines we have on this come from the Institute of Medicine, which is now 11 years old, that recommend 800 units a day. That could be through diet if you're over 70, 600 if you're under 70. So 800 would have been the right answer until Vital came out, I suppose, although it, the evidence is mixed. It's hard to get through diet, by the way. You gotta have fish or eggs or fortified milk. That's about it. There have been no large randomized trials of vitamin D alone to determine the risk of fracture until now. So this study was called Vital. It was a huge study that actually was looking at vitamin D supplementation and omega-3 fatty acids. And the primary goal of Vital was actually to look at cancer and cardiovascular disease results from vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids. It was a negative study, but they also looked at fractures. Okay, so that's what we're gonna talk about. It was uh, the biggest study we'll talk about, 26,000 patients. You had to be a man over 50 or you had to be a woman over 55. That was about it. You couldn't have cardiovascular disease or cancer at baseline. You were excluded with end-stage renal disease or cirrhosis or hypercalcemia. And then you got 2,000 units of vitamin D or placebo. Supplements were allowed. You, you weren't forced to stop, and you couldn't take more than 800 units of vitamin D if you were already taking it. And then they followed these people for five and a half years, and they looked at fracture. Hip fracture, non-vertebral fracture, overall fracture. They also looked at fractures that excluded some of those fractures that might not be related to fragility or osteoporosis. So that was their secondary endpoint. So the median age was 66, half were men, 20% black, uh, 28 was the mean BMI, and of only 5% were already on osteoporosis medications. 10% had had a prior fragility fracture. 43% were taking already vitamin D, they were allowed to continue with limits, and 20% were taking calcium supplements. The mean baseline vitamin D level was 31, which is technically normal but 13% had a level less than 20. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So in the active arm, they did see an increase as expected in the vitamin D level from an average of 29 to an average of 41. And then here are the results. You can see those curves just about overlap. Y-axis is fractures, X-axis is time. No difference in total non-vertebral or hip fractures. They looked at every subgroup you could think of, sex, age, race, race, BMI, if you were already using vitamin D, if you had a low vitamin D level, they even looked at the subgroup of people who were under 20 and showed no benefit in that group also. Or if you were at higher risk of fracture because you were on a medication or you'd already had a fragility fracture, none of those people benefited from supplemental vitamin D. So daily supplement of vitamin D, 2000 units, does not reduce fractures in generally healthy older adults. That's what we learned from Vital. So the answer for your grandma, is A. You guys were on a great streak. Let's see if we can get back to it. Now your grandpa, you just hang up with grandma and then grandpa calls. He wants advice from you. He has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he has hefpef. He has dyspnea, which has been attributed to his heart if he walks more than a block or if he goes up and down stairs. He's on amlodipine and chlorthalidone. He's a non-smoker. His blood pressure is pretty good. He's got no JVD, he's got no RALS, he does have one plus edema, he has the dyspnea as we talked about. His echo shows an EF of 55%, robust systolic function, but he does have diastolic dys dysfunction evident on the echo. And he says, you're so smart, you're the doctor, tell me what to do. What do you tell your grandpa that he should do about his HEFPEF? You should add nitrates, you should add DIG, you should add empagliflozin, Nothing works. Ah, you should just get ready for the big one. That's like an 80s joke, Laura. If you've seen Sanford and Son, right? The big one, right. Okay, so one person got it. Okay. Uh, all of you guys were at Evan Klein's Grand Rounds, I see. Strong work. And thank you to Dr. Klein. Um, and Pagliflozin for preserved EF. So the state of the evidence here is kind of like this. For HEFPEF, nothing works. It's a failure. And let's talk about the failures. So spironolactone was studied in HEFPEF. 
Uh, there was a, a secondary outcome that was better, but the primary outcome, there was no difference. They tried uh, Secubitril, Valsartan, or Entresto. That had no difference in the primary outcome. Again, there was some hint of a benefit in the secondary outcome. ACE inhibitors have been studied in, in less large trials, shown to have no benefit. Uh, Herbisartan and Candesartan have been studied in this context. Candesartan, again, a secondary benefit, uh, but nothing in the primary outcome. Beta blockers, when they've done some meta-analyses of all the beta blocker studies, they took people over 50, looked at those group, no benefit. So, and nitrates, DIG, and sildenafil have all been studied for HEFPEF and have shown no benefit. So it's been really empty in terms of our armamentarium for people with HEFPEF. The only thing that hasn't been studied well are calcium channel blockers. And we know that these SGLT2 inhibitors, like empagliflozin, have clearly improved outcomes significantly in HEF-REF, those with reduced ejection fraction. So the question of emperor preserved was, what about an SGLT2 inhibitor in the setting of HEF-PEF? So this was an, as you can imagine, industry sponsored. They were more than happy to do this trial. Multi-center randomized trial, 6,000 patients. You had to have class two through four. So remember, NYHA class one means you're asymptomatic. So you had to have symptoms like our patient who would be NYHA class two. You had to have a uh, hospitalization for CHF in the last year or evidence of structural heart disease, either LVH or left atrial enlargement. You had to have an EF over 40, obviously, to be in this study. And then you had to have a BNP over 300, over 900 if you had a fib. They excluded people who had other kinds of heart disease, infiltrative, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, severe valvular disease. If you had uncontrolled ventricular response with a fib, you were excluded, and very advanced kidney disease. Then they were randomized to empagliflozin 10 milligrams, which is the lower dose, versus placebo. And they followed them for two years. The primary outcome was this composite. This is important. We're going to come back to this point. Composite of cardiovascular death plus hospitalization for CHF. And then they broke that down in terms of the secondary outcomes, and they also looked at your GFR decline. So the median age was 72, about half were women, three quarters were white, 4% black, 14% Asian, 81% were NYHA class two. And you can see the EF when they subgrouped it was pretty evenly spread. Everyone was above 40, but otherwise pretty evenly spread. And a third were not, were ischemic and 64% had no ischemia. Half had diabetes, and here are the results. Y-axis is the primary outcome, and X-axis is time, and you can see a 21% reduction in that primary outcome with empagliflozin. So that turns into a number needed to treat of 31. You can see the primary outcome numbers there. Uh, hospitalization for CHF drove this. Uh, a very significant reduction in hospitalization for CHF. When they looked at that subgroup of cardiovascular death there was a trend, but no significant difference. And so the big question that comes up, I'll just say now with these SGLT2 inhibitors, if you remember the way that they work, they, SGLT2 is an enzyme that reabsorbs the glucose that you naturally deposit into your urinary lumen. So if you block that reabsorption, you deposit more glucose and you essentially have glucosuria and then water follows that. It's essentially a type of diuretic in that sense. This is why you have more genital and uh, uh, genital infections with SGLT2 inhibitors for this reason, the glucosuria. So I think one of the appropriate critiques of empagliflozin and all the, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors all the way along with these CHF studies has been, what if you randomized it versus furosemide? What would happen then? <laughs> that study needs to be done. Uh, cardiovascular death, a non-significant difference, uh, consistent among diabetes versus no diabetes, there was a slower rate of GFR decline. We've seen this before with SGLT2 inhibitors. They do slow the progression of renal disease. So there's that benefit. All-cause mortality was equal. There was no difference in serious adverse events in the two groups. As expected, more UTIs and more genital infections in the SGLT2 inhibitor group. We know that's true. A little somewhat provocative subgroup finding here when you break down by EF. And what you'll see here is less than 50 at the top row and then greater than 60 at the bottom row. And you can, you can imagine that there's a trend here that <clears throat> you may look at this and say, well, maybe more of the benefit is in the people with lower EF. Now, the one thing I wanna say about this is you can't really draw, you can't walk away from this and draw any firm conclusions. As a matter of fact, Depagliflozin, about three or four weeks ago, published their own study in the same setting, HEFPEF, 
showed benefit, just like in pagliflozin. And dipagliflozin in that study, it was just as much benefit over 60% as there was under 60%. So that would refute possibly the idea that maybe if you really have totally normal EF, you're not gonna benefit. That's just speculative. Uh, in patients with HEFPEF, what we can conclude is that empagliflozin reduces the outcome of CV death plus CHF hospitalizations. So the answer here in this patient with HEFPEF, none of these things have benefit except for C. So C was definitely the right answer. Okay. All right, you're at a friend's kid's birthday party. Hank's had a few. You know, this happens when you go to these neighborhood events. Hey, doc, what can I do about this beer gut? You're a doctor, right? What do I do about this? I heard you can just like pop a pill now, right? His BMI is 33. He does not have diabetes. He's never taken meds for obesity before. What would be most effective to help Hank with his obesity? Contrave, which is now Trexone bupropion. Cusimia, which is topiramate fentermine. Semaglutide, 2.4 milligrams weekly, also known as Wegovi, or terzepatide, 15 milligrams a week, or maybe disulfiram. That might get rid of the beer gut. I'm gonna end the polling quickly because we're I'm a little short on time, but uh, there's obviously you guys are debating between C and D, a slight favorite for C. This study that just came out about three months ago was, on, was about terzepatide for the treatment of obesity. So the background here, this is the list of medications that have been FDA approved for the treatment of weight loss. All of these medicines have been shown to have benefit. The top four all achieve about five to 10% loss of your original body weight. The only exception is semaglutide, item five here. Their study showed more like about a 15% reduction in body weight with the use of semaglutide. The endocrine society, there are endocrine society guidelines that are from 2015 that do suggest if your BMI is over 30, that we should be using medication, but only 2% or less of people are prescribed these medicines. We know why, cost, lack of familiarity with them, concern about side effects, not without reason. So what is terzepatide? It's like, how many new names do we have to learn? This is ridiculous. I'm sorry, you gotta learn this one too, because you're gonna be hearing about it. It's a GLP-1 agonist, but it also is an agonist of this other hormone called GIP, which is glucose dependent, insulinotropic polypeptide. Do not memorize that. Here's what they do. You can see in the black is GLP-1. It reduces food intake. It increases satiety. The satiety. It reduces gastric emptying. And then this GIP has some additional benefits. It also reduces food intake. It increases insulin sensitivity. It increases insulin levels. And uh, so this was an industry-sponsored multi-center randomized trial. 2,500 patients, quite a large study. And you had to have a BMI over 30 or over 27 if you had hypertension, dyslipidemia, coronary disease, OSA. You had to never have tried, oh, you had to have tried to lose weight before. I'm sure they excluded a lot of people based on that criterion, right? Have you ever tried to lose weight before? Okay, excluded. Diabetes, uh, importantly, diabetes excluded. These are non diabetics. Uh, if you had prior surgical treatment or if you had recently tried some other medication, you were excluded. And then you were randomized to terzepatide 5, 10, or 15. This is a once weekly injection. It's one of those you know, newfangled, you just like pop it. It's as simple as could be. And they titrated that up very gradually, 2.5 milligrams for four weeks, and then five milligrams for four weeks. And then if you went up from there, another two point, you know, it was up to 2.5 every four weeks. It took a while to get to 15. And then everyone got lifestyle counseling in both arms. And they followed them for quite a while, almost a year and a half. The primary outcome was percent change in your body weight or if you were able to achieve 5% weight loss at that time period. They looked at these secondary outcomes, including blood pressure, lipids. We'll come back to that. And the results, median age 45, 68% women, 71% white, 8% uh, black, 48% Latinx. Mean BMI was 38. And 41% had prediabetes. Here are the results. Y-axis is the percent change in your body weight. And you can see quite dramatic results in favor of all arms of terzepatide. Put another way, the row here is the percent change in your weight. And you can see how much, I mean, there was a, a little bit of weight loss in the placebo group, as there often is in these trials with all the intensive counseling, but much more weight loss in the active arms. Put another way, if you translate it to pounds, this is how many pounds people lost on average in those three groups. How many lost at least 5%? 
uh, upwards of 85, 90% in the active arm with terzepatide. Blood pressure dropped seven millimeters of mercury in the active arms. HDL went up eight points. You know, HDL is hard to budge. It's impressive. LDL went down, triglycerides dropped significantly. Better physical functioning. They cured 95% of the people who had prediabetes of their prediabetes. Uh, adverse events, uh, more in the active arm. They were mostly GI side effects. It's nausea, diarrhea, constipation at the top of the list there. And it's quite common. But serious adverse events were the same, except for cholecystitis, which was more common in the people who lost all the weight. Uh, these adverse events, how many actually had to discontinue? Quite a low number, only about 6% in the active arm discontinued because of the side effects. You can imagine some of these people were probably highly motivated to continue despite having side effects. So terzepatide leads to substantial weight loss in patients with obesity, currently retailing at $1,400 a month and uh, not covered by courts. So there's that minor point. We can talk about that maybe in the Q&A, but I wanna move on because I've got other studies to tell you about. The answer here, terzepatide, now semaglutide is not a bad answer, but that's more like 15% uh, body weight loss and terzepatide showed 20%. So slight favorite here with D. Okay. Ricky, your husband has got asthma. He's running short on his inhaler. Hey honey, you're a doctor. Can you just fill my albuterol for me? He's 35, he's had asthma for 25 years. He takes albuterol and fluticasone as his inhalers right now. The fluticasone is twice a day, every day. And he's got symptoms uh, four or five days a week, he reaches for that albuterol. He's using it probably four or five days a week because of symptoms. He has not had any recent exacerbations, but he wants you to refill his albuterol. So what do you tell your precious husband, Ricky, about his asthma? Yeah, I got you covered, we'll hook you up. Or, well, let's refill that, but I wanna add Montelukast. Or, I actually want to switch your albuterol to budesonide for motorol. Or, hey, who needs an inhaler when you're living la vida loca? You say that to Ricky. No one's willing to tell Ricky that. Okay. So slight favorite for the budesonide for motorol. Okay. So this study, New England Journal, fairly recent, uh, reliever triggered inhaled steroids in Black and Latinx adults with asthma. So the, this is not actually, this one study is not a huge landmark study, but there has been a huge landmark change in the way we manage asthma, which is why I'm including this study. That's one reason, there are others too. So here's what's happened in the world of asthma. Repeated lines of evidence now are showing that whether you have mild asthma or moderate asthma, if your rescue inhaler is a short-acting beta agonist like albuterol, you do worse than if your rescue inhaler is an inhaled steroid combined with a long-acting beta agonist. And that long-acting beta agonist is preferentially for motorol, which has a rapid onset of action. So it works quickly, unlike salmeterol, which is the Advair medicine. For motorol also has a long duration. So it's got both of those benefits. And it's when they've done these studies of people with mild asthma or even moderate asthma, and they randomize them to your rescue is albuterol or your rescue is the fromoterol steroid combo, that latter group has fewer exacerbations, fewer hospitalizations for asthma. There is indirect evidence that links the use of SABAs alone with higher rates of death. And so this strategy has evolved, which is called SMART, it stands for Single Maintenance and Reliever Therapy. And so this is the GINA guidelines. GINA is the Global Initiative for Asthma. It's like the gold group for COPD. And I, they've got two different tracks that they want you to follow, but they actually prefer track one. They prefer track one. So I'm just gonna show that one. And what you'll see here is that for step one and two, that you might call that mild asthma, you, you no longer are supposed to use an as-needed albuterol. You're supposed to use an as-needed steroid for motorol inhaler. And then when you get to step three and you're having to take daily steroids, your reliever should be the same inhaler as your maintenance medication. So it's much more simple for patients. They have the same inhaler that they take each day that they also use when they have symptoms. And that strategy has been shown to reduce hospitalizations and exacerbations in people with asthma. So the other part of the study that's worth talking about is the gross disparity 
in outcomes in patients of different races and ethnicity. Black and Latinx populations have asthma mortality that is twice as high, literally two times as high as whites. And so this study was a randomized, open-label, pragmatic trial. And uh, you had, they had 1,200 patients who self-identified as Black or Latinx, prescribed steroids, and they had to have either uncontrolled symptoms or a recent exacerbation. Can I get a time check? I'm not sure that clock is... Okay, the clock is slow. Okay, so uh, you were excluded if you had to use an oral steroid in the last month or COPD. And then they were randomized to either usual care or a steroid inhaler with your, as your rescue inhaler. So this was not the steroid uh, formoterol combination. This was just a steroid inhaler that they were to use as needed along with their rescue inhaler, which it was mostly albuterol. So slightly different than what I just told you about, but a very pragmatic design. Because the, well, I won't get into it. 15 month follow up. The primary outcome was severe asthma exacerbations. And then they measured your control, your quality of life, days missed from work or school. And the median age was 48, 84% women, half were black and half were Latinx, as it turned out. 20% were current or former smokers. 72% were on an inhaled steroid LABA combination inhaler. 28% were on an inhaled steroid alone as their daily maintenance inhaler. 72% had had an exacerbation requiring steroids in the last year. And two thirds actually used a nebulizer as their quick reliever rather than an albuterol inhaler. So here are the results, x-axis time, y-axis is number of severe exacerbations. And you can see the separation of curves. So the hazard ratio was 0.85. That was statistically significant. They had improved symptom control, improved quality of life, fewer days of missing school or work if you were in the steroid inhaler arm. And how much more steroid did they use? Not a lot. On average, 1.1 canister extra of steroid per year if your rescue included a steroid inhaler. There were fewer refills of your quick reliever, your SABA, if you were in the steroid group. Equal results among all subgroups in this study, no difference in serious adverse events. So in black and Latinx patients with persistent asthma, which was this study, adding an, an inhaled steroid as your as needed inhaler resulted in fewer exacerbations. So the correct answer here would have been for this patient, C, adding a steroid to his quick reliever, okay? Now, because of time, I'm actually going to skip through this study and I wanna go right to the summary slide and then take questions. But this study I'm showing you right now shows the Mediterranean diet is good, eat it, okay? You guys got that? That was the summary of that. So what did we learn today? So number one, in older adults, a blood pressure goal systolic of 110s to 120s leads to better outcomes than a goal of 130s to 140s. We learned that stopping antidepressants in people who feel like they can will give you an increased risk of relapse. We learned that chlorothaladone does have efficacy at reducing blood pressure in people with even advanced CKD. We learned that vitamin D has no benefit in terms of fracture reduction in older adults. And pagliflozin reduces death slash CHF hospitalizations, emphasis on the latter, in patients with HEFPEF. Once we weekly terzepatide leads to substantial and significant weight loss. Adding steroids to a rescue inhaler will help asthmatics. And Mediterranean diet does reduce cardiovascular risk in patients with coronary artery or uh, coronary heart disease. I leave you with the stages of quarantine and happy to take any questions. There are a couple of questions that came through the Q&A that I'll ask as people in the audience are thinking. First one for the depression study, were the patients uh, given a placebo when they were taken off their SSRI? So the question is whether patients were given a placebo when they were taken off their SSRI in the Antler study. Um, I knew this was gonna happen. I don't remember the answer to that question. You would hope that they would have. I can't remember. Okay, and a uh, question about vitamin D. Were there, would there be other reasons we would want to treat vitamin D deficiency? Because there is perhaps other benefits. So since the risk of supplementation is low, would it be worth giving anyway? 
That's a great question and a fair question. And I think the risk of supplementation is low. They didn't show any serious adverse events in the people who got uh, the vitamin D supplementation. The problem is that as far as I know, the data is weak in terms of real benefit of vitamin D in other domains. So the vital study, remember, was originally designed to look at cancer and cardiovascular disease with supplemental vitamin D. There was no benefit in terms of cancer reduction. There was no benefit in terms of cardiovascular risk reduction. There is no benefit in terms of fracture risk reduction. So if there are other benefits, uh, I think we probably need to see some robust data that would prove that to be true. But you know, the risk is minimal. So there's, we don't have to rush out and tell our patients to stop taking vitamin D. All right, thank you. And regarding the study of terzepidide, <laughs> uh, any benefits or what is the use of that in diabetics? Is there good data? Terzepatide has been approved for diabetes already. It's actually not yet been approved for the treatment of obesity. Despite this study, uh, there's another study they're waiting for, but, and, but they're on the fast track to get it approved. So there is evidence of terzepatide having efficacy in diabetes. Um, and if I'm thinking where you might be going with that question, it's maybe wondering, well, if someone needs to lose weight and they have diabetes, let's use that and they'll, they'll lose the weight. I think that the data is very solid for semaglutide in that setting. So semaglutide can be used for diabetes, has a lot of data showing efficacy in that setting and also induces significant 15% weight loss. So uh, if you can't get the semaglutide weight loss covered, which you can't, then you can use semaglutide slightly lower dose for diabetes if you're diabetic, and you will uh, maybe not get all of the weight loss you would have with the high dose semaglutide, but you'll still get some. That's what I would encourage. Okay, one more question. The question in the back here. That okay, we'll go get. ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah, so the chlorthalidone study, oh, repeat the question, thank you. Um, the question is in the chlorthalidone study, did they look at gout outcomes? And the answer is yes, and there was no increase in gout in that study. However, any of you who use chlorthalidone know that it does increase the risk of gout. I've had it happen many times to my patients. So I think that's a great point to bring up. I don't think it was probably powered, it's a relatively small study, probably wasn't powered to find that outcome, but I think we can all be pretty secure in knowing that a thiazide diuretic will increase the risk of gout. So thank you for bringing that up. All right, one more comment uh, from Dr. Bhutani regarding the chlorthalidone study. Yes, thiazides do work in advanced CKD, but I would be interested in seeing hyponatremia rates without loop diuretic use. This electrolyte issue would be my main concern with sole, sole thiazide use in CKD since we know it affects water balance. We have to note the New England Journal study was very small for follow-up time. And it's important to keep in mind before we start using thiazide without appropriate monitoring in the high-risk group, yes. Thank you. And if any of you know Dr. Bhutani, she is very, very smart. So, <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Bhutani, for that caveat. That's a very important point. All right, without any further questions, we will end just a couple minutes early. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for a great- My pleasure.